Hey there, and welcome back. So let's keep working this shape optimization case. So, so far we have introduced, we have covered uh, uh, a lot, by the way, and um, we have introduced a few optimization methods, techniques like gradient based methods and also design space exploration. Now let's talk to the old method that we haven't covered yet, which is derivative free methods. So pretty much like gradient uh, based optimization, the end here is to look to, for that optimal value. So these methods are, uh, are another way to, uh, are a way to avoid the gradient evaluation, which can be tricky now sometimes in the case of noisy data. So one of the big advantage of this derivative free methods is that we can have noisy data and pretty much they are insensitive to, to that behavior. Also, they can be global and local. Instead, when we use gradient-based uh, optimization, they have the tendency to be local. Now, when you have a local minimum, they will be stuck in that point. And when they do have noise, also they will get stuck in that in that noise in that noise. Instead, derivative free, they don't suffer of those problems. The only drawback will be that they are expenses. They need a lot of function evaluation. But today methods they are very advanced and they can have similar performance to grading based optimization as I'm going to show you. Well, one thing important also that I think you have the idea that if you have enough computational resources, just doing 50, 100, 200 uh, function evaluations, it's not that bad. It's not in this, that expensive. You can deal with that. So let's talk about that. And here you have this figure, this animation. So here, this is how the Let's say the simplex methods move in a space. Then we have also, in this case, this is uh, multi-objective multi optimization using a genetic algorithm. And the idea here all is, is brute force, basically. You see that you start to do a lot of evaluations, keep evaluating, evaluating, until you find a point where the solution cannot improve anymore. So this is what we call now the Pareto frown. So then we're going to have a dedicated video for multi-objective optimization, but this is the way it works. Now, so here kind of the idea is that we're doing brute force, a lot of function evaluations until we get to that value. Uh, a, remind, a reminder here that we have this decision matrix now that we build all the methods. So here kind of, if you want to choose a method here, you can use you now this matrix to choose the best method according to, you, to your case. But for instance, you have any smooth and expensive function, any method will work, but grading base optimization will be the best one, will have the best convergence rate and so on. Okay, so this is when you don't have noise. In the case that you have noise, uh, non-smooth uh, function uh, and expensive, the gradient start to, to have problems. So in the end, you will see that derivative-free methods are the best methods. And then we talk about surrogate-based optimization that also later, or meta models. We're going to have a video dedicated to that. Everything we think now, this Dakota ecosystem with open fun and so on. So you have this decision matrix now also. Let me remind you about documentation and maybe I will look, I will sound like a broken record for those who knows what is a, <laughs> what is a record. So I will sound like a broken record, but remember you have the documentation. So please go and read the documentation, get familiar with the method. But also here you have, you know, like I showed you this decision matrix, and this is more specific to what you have in Dakota. And here you have a few methods, how, what the developers recommend, but at the end, in the end will be up to you. So when we go here to derivative free method, we have these options and depending what you have, you can have bound constraint and bounded problems, linear, nonlinear constraints, discrete variables and so on. So here you have recommendations. So of this one, we're going to run the same problem. We're not going to test all, all the pro, all the methods. We're going, I'm going to show you the best one, but it's up to you to test it. It's very affordable uh, uh, to use this method. Coming back also to, to documentation, I recommend you, you know, also to get familiar with the literature, with the literature theory behind. And there is a very good book, an outer bander plots. Probably, you know, so visit this website. So this is a bit 
shout out to him and not really to anything uh with him but well for those working on optimization probably you know who he is uh van der Plaats. and he has a very good book i i strongly recommend this book it's fantastic a little bit expensive but it's a really good one so i just want to recommend okay it worth every single uh sent okay so that being said i digress a little bit for for the actual uh hands-on so let's move to the case and here we have the derivative free folder you should be able to download you should have the link where we have all these files and let me open this case um let me put here we know how everything works so far the workflow and we open the coda case in where we have our problem formulation remember formulate your problem get your tools ha you must have everything ready don't miss a file because otherwise you launch this and you it's going to stop immediately. You're going to waste time, especially if you're running in HPC centers that you have uh, long queues. So let me go here, uh, simulator scripts, but pretty much simulator script, nothing changes. In our case formulation, it's pretty much the same. I see that method is where we change sense. So in this case, we will derivative free. And I put here many de derivative free methods implemented in the code. I don't put all of them. I tested, I put some comments here, but what is important about these methods is that uh, you should aim for those methods that uh, can run in parallel, that can do concurrent evaluation. So otherwise, if you run uh, sequentially, it will be too expensive. So here you have, a few of them, for instance, this one, the, the solid wet, wet uh, there is no concurrency. So it can be a good one, but it's serious. So it is a little bit slow. So I put some comments here and here at the end, I have the ones with the best performance. This is the one I recommend you. They are very good. They give the solution. Okay. So the same case that we have with the grading that we know that what is the shape that you, we shall get. We're going to get that with a little bit more function evaluation, but the big advantage here is that you can have noise in your data and so on, or can be local global minimum, and these methods will be insensitive to that, and they can be very efficient. So I'm not going to test all of them. Let me show you a few a few of them, and it will run live. So one of the methods that I like the most, and I think this is another complete video regarding efficient global optimization so this is a mixture between the science space exploration and uh, meta models and derivative free or grading based methods so let me show you the idea of this method and let me go here that i think i have it in this presentation just to give you a brief idea of what is happening in this method with an example. I'm not going into details what is the case, but basically what we're doing in this case using efficient global optimization is that first you do a sampling plan, no? design a space exploration. Using that sampling plan, you can construct your surrogate or meta model or whatever you want to call it. Okay. And then you exploit and optimize this surrogate, but not necessarily optimized. No? So let's to clarify something that, for instance, you can start from this point, this black square can represent your starting point and you can get to this optimal value in the surrogate. But this is in, in the hope that you constructed a good surrogate, but usually this surrogate is not very good. There is an error. So you might uh, arrive here to a point that is not ideal or is something that you get there due to noise. But the idea here is that when you get these two points, you can do what is called infilling. Infilling, you use this point to improve your surrogate. So see the triangles here are new points that we added to improve the surrogate. So the efficient global optimization is doing that. But instead of getting the optimal value in your surrogate, it is going to use an improve no function, no a quantity, or can use also the variance. So according to that metric, it will maximize it to reduce the error in the construction of the surrogate. I don't want to go too much into details. You have the Dakota documentation to, to, to see more about that. But th basically, this is what we're doing. We're reconstructing surrogates using information from some function that were computed. So, and just to make it here as you saw, you have the documentation and let's say that we have efficient global and here you have 
some theory, a few uh, small descriptions. So this is now what is doing the ego is maximizing this expected improvement function. Now, so we'll look for that value, optimal value, and this is what is controlling everything. So you can use this improvement function, you can use variance, or you can go and use the, 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 your objective function, but it's not recommended because that it will converge to some values and you want not to reduce the error in your, in, in your server. Okay. So let's work with this case. So efficient global optimization in Dakota does, uh, it only ask, and let me, it's a way confusion here. Okay. A single line. So it will ask you for a seat value. So remember, first you construct as, uh, you, uh, a design space exploration experiment. So you give a seat value. Also, you can give a number of of point that you want to evaluate. So the default size is something like this, but then there is some standard practice that you can say 10 times the number of design variables, or there are more elaborate. So later I will talk about that. So for it, in this case, N means the number of design variables. So for the here, we'll use 15 points, but probably because we have four design variables, but probably would be better to use 14. Okay. So you also can define that on uh, as usual, you go into documentation and you will have batch uh, all the, that information there. So then you have these options now that you can define this batch size, Batch size is the total of parallel evaluations. Those points that you look in the surrogate to improve now to maximize that uh, that improve function now that expected improvement function and then also you can do some exploration of these 12 points you can put two points to explore uh, explore what is happening okay so this is how it, it, it works it's very efficient this is the method i like to use so visit here the options and let me run this case to show you what is happening okay so this case also scales very well see that you can hear you know, put a batch size of 20, 40, whatever, and all the sampling that you're doing also can be in parallel. So let me go here, launch, read that, that could, uh, and although, sorry, I need to move into the directory. I have everything there already. And let's be the cut case. And always I like to, I have here at the beginning, I like to save this lot files that I have the trace and everything there. So now I launch and see that it's launching 15 function evaluations at the same time. Okay. So that is, is designing first your sampling plan, and then it's going to do the surrogate based optimization. No, using the expected improvement function, maximizing that. So here's running. So now my fan in my computer is kicking in. Everything is done in, par in parallel. So here somewhere already. So, so here, when you see this one, this is the surrogate that is being constructed. So it's using a Gaussian process, now creating interpolation with a, a small data set. So something, a big warning here that this creating interpolation can be very expensive when you have large uh sampling data so you said in efficient global optimization you don't get into those issues but have in mind that that is you put there a thousand points that can be very expensive that surrogate but the idea is that when you construct that surrogate you work here so see that it's just doing in feeling and feeling and feeling and computing some quantities but within feeling and looking at that expect, expected improvement function it will improve that surrogate until it gets to the right value. So I think at this point it should have converged. And actually, yeah, it's done. It run very fast. And if we look at the folder, look at that. This method, it, there's something about, uh, it conducted like 51 iterations, okay? Those iterations include the first 15 or 14 iterations that are the sampling plan and then surrogate, evaluating, explore, exploit, and do them fill. If you go back to the grading methods, you will see that those grading methods, they take also something like this, about 20, 30, 40 iterations. So for this specific case, it is about the same uh, complexity and time. And this method is much better because now you can get a feeling that as you go back to the gradient method, in the gradient method, you need to give, like, how do I want to evaluate the gradient? My starting point, you need to bound your domain. Uh, you have also some 
other limitations. Do you have noise and so on? That here you don't have any of those limitations. As you can see here, I don't need to define any of those options. So just here, something specific to the, let's say, the level of parallelism and on. And how do you want to explore your domain? Okay, so it's in a way, it's much, much, much simpler. So here we have it. Then you have table out. Remember that usually in table out, you have all the output. So here, this table out is just showing you all the experiments, it's not telling you, like in the other cases, that usually the last iteration will be the, the best one, like in grading. So here, you need to look at the output and the standard output. So that's why I like to say it's because there's where you have that information safe. So just let's look at the whole string that we have in this output. And you will see everything that was happening, the function evaluations, the creating, and so on, what was doing. But what is interesting is I go to the very end here, I will have the best parameter. So the time that it took, so as you see, it was something really, really fast and very accurate. So it took this time in the best evaluation you have in the case 37 and that function evaluation 37 would correspond to the to the work there set 37 and see that we have the solution that is you recall from the grading okay this is the one that is going to give you the minimum drag okay so you can check with the grading so at the actual one in the grading is 0 0.5 0 0.5 at uh, 0 0.25 and 0 so see here that it there is some different there, but okay, potato, 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 small different. Okay, some decimal points, there is not a problem. And remember that this is based on approximation. So this is a fantastic result. These are the methods that honestly I recommend I recommend to you. So you see that this method is kind of a mixture of everything that we have done. So in the end, optimization in CFD engineering design will be a mixture of design space exploration, gradient, and so on, brute force methods that in this specific case, we're putting everything together. So now let me look at the specific directory 37. And if I open Paraphon, let's see, I'm just going to see the geometry. So just to confirm and recall that for our problem formulation, we want to arrive to this geometry and everything, it is okay. So this is how we do derivative-free optimization using, in this case, the ego method no, which I really, really like. So then also when we address uh, surrogate-based optimization, now we're going to revisit this ego method or efficient global optimization. So yeah, this is one of the options. And let's run with another case. Let me clean out everything. So remember, before running, clean everything. Be careful also to save those outputs if you want to keep it there. As usual here, I have the solutions of a few methods and just let me go there and see that here, I already run all these methods and here you're going to find the files and everything. You know how it's converging. Every case is converging to the right solution. So this is a beautiful problem that we careful design it now to always get to this solution. It doesn't matter what method you use. It's everything has been set up in the right way. You should get to this one for minimum drag. Okay. We get to this one because we're forcing the case problem formulation. We're over constraining this problem. We're pushing, forcing this to converge to, to, to this specific condition. So later I'm go we're going to talk more about this because it's very interesting case with, we, we, we were thinking about many things when doing this. Also, like we were thinking in turbulence modeling. So if we put here is the Reynolds right now, if one, 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 one thousand, so it's a, let's say a toy case really fast, but it's the one you can add your boundary layer and you can run as a large, uh, at, at a larger Reynolds number, let's say hundred thousand. And you would see that in that case, the minimum drag you have it here in this case, even though that this one, you have more surface. This is the minimum drag. Why? Because this case, where it produced less pressure drag. This one, while the skin friction drag is low, lower than this one, the pressure drag produced by this one is larger than this one. So here we start to talk about transition to tolerance. So, so when formulating this problem, we were thinking about that. So when you start to elaborate things and put models and so on, you will see that you might 
converts to this one, to this solution, but everything should be here. And since we'll get even more interesting as you, instead of minimizing drag, you look at, you look at lift to drag ratio. So you are going to prefer a slender body like this, but it's a little bit more cool water. But this case is not preferred to a cool water because it will increase by a lot the drag. So the prefer, preferred solution will be somewhere here. And then also when we move to multi-objective optimization, where we have multiple solutions, all the ideal solutions will be from here to here. So later it's very interesting now that we're going to get all those solutions here. So it's not a coincidence that we're always converging within this, this shape because we, we, we plan this very careful. Okay. So I digress a little bit there. So now let's move to another method. So the next method that I want to test. So here, let me comment this to move to the other method. It is mesh adaptive. Uh, search. So if I don't use efficient global, I would use this method. I really, really like this method. It's called also MAT. So let's see. It's a fantastic method. It's kind of for those that likes meshing. It is kind of doing some meshes in your parametrical space and getting the solution. So this is the method oh, and I really, really like it. So this was, let's see, there is a very good, okay. Nomad is this one. Yeah. Okay. So this is a very famous Nomad mat. So this is the original library. Actually it's the one used in, in, in Dakota. So it's implemented. So you can come here and, and check what, what they're doing, how this, this method works, but it's a fantastic method. Okay. It's scale well, okay. However, the number of functional evaluations that you do here can do here, the maximum number is proportional to the number of design variables. So in this case, we have four, so it will be four plus one, five is the maximum. Okay, how it works because it's moving in all directions and so on. So it, it scale well, but you have that, that limitation like in the gradient. Then it will ask you for some information like the initial delta is like the perturbation. You start from a point and let's perturbate your design space in every direction by this delta. And then it's going to start to do from this initial value, the step size is going to choose the best value. Okay, so it's going to do some, some kind of a search the search direction or directional search. Uh, so this method also, as you, you, you can hear, you will have here mesh adaptive somewhere here. Let's see that you have the, okay, you have it here. So look at that. This one is recommended for derivative free local. So this is one that it, it will find local minimum. This for will guarantee global. And then you can use it for all these different conditions. So here you have all the values that you can put. So everything is optional. So as you look at here, I added this because I wanted to change. So as you change it, but as you don't put anything, it would work. It would use default values and there are different options. So get familiar with everything, get familiar with limitations and so on, rip paper, the presentations, papers and so on. So let's run this method. Okay. So I go here and it's pretty much the same that I need to do here. And boom, there it goes. So actually, yeah, this one, it launched ba -ba -dum -bum -bum -bum, many cases. Actually, I think the, the, para the level of parallelization is this one. I think it is, no, it's, ta -ta -ta -ta. I need to check, actually, let me see if I save it. Yeah, it's adaptive mesh. So yeah, probably it's larger, the level of parallelization, a top. Let me check here. So yes, running Salome. So bam, 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 bam. Okay. So probably yeah, it's three times N. Yeah. Three times the number of this design variables. I need to check that, but as I say, it scales very well, but it will have a limitation. Like you cannot run infinite functions evaluation at the same time or infinite, no, a large number like in design space exploration, but yeah, it's running perfectly. And at this point, you see that it's just doing function about, okay, sorry. Okay. I make a mistake because I'm running. No, see that I am still running. I see here my creation and it's still running the derivative free. So what? Okay. I didn't save. So to kill this one, control C. Okay. 
to kill everything that is running. And remember that you probably will have something in memory, so you need to wait a little bit. Be sure to kill all the processes that running. Okay, let me be sure that I don't have anything in memory. Okay, it's not running. And I think now I will have, let me double check. So this is the stuff I mentioned, be sure to have the scripts, everything defined, because if I were running in a cluster that it takes probably one day to get from that bloody queue, you would just wait, waste your time. So yeah, I save it, it's this one. So yeah, this one, it will be M plus one or probably 2m plus 1, I don't recall, but yeah, you have one limitation with the number of the same values. So let me change, let me launch, and yeah, I see that now is the math. So the first function evaluation, usually the central point will be one single evaluation, and then it will launch everything. So here I already see that it's launching the different processes. So I'll see that I have four function evaluation. So it's doing the number of the same variables. And I think the maximum will be five or at most it will be two M plus one nine function evaluations that you can run. So basically you have the math running there. So at this point I will stay quiet and I will let it run and let's see what we get here. Okay, so I'm back. So after that moment of silence of the solver running, and you just put here you now the performance. So you saw that everything was running in parallel, orchestrated by the code and so on. So we have a solution here, and probably you realize that this one was much slower than the efficient global optimization. Okay, so basically it was much slower because even though it's running in parallel, we have that limit that it was the maximum number of concurrent function evaluation is proportional to the number of the same variables. So let me check if it is proportional node n plus one or two times n plus one. Okay, so it will be if it is five or nine, but any case, uh, in efficient global, do you have, you don't have that limitation. You can just deploy a lot of here. You will leave, you will be limited. So that's why it was a slower, but not only that, let's check our log file, but what's happening here. Okay. Because maybe this method converged quite fast, but then due to precision, it was there dancing around your optimal value. So you have all those iterations that probably you waste time, but it was because just the, those small numerical precision, all those details, it was there moving around. So probably you could have to stop this simulation way earlier, not way until all those iterations. Uh, also just careful read your output here. So sometimes at the end you get where you have the optimal value, so on. and But it's better to look to the log files. So let's, let me go here. Okay. So in this case, so you have all those function evaluations as usual. So uh, always save that log file that you have there a lot of information. So if I print it here, you have all the functions evaluation. You have the best parameter that is in this, in this case, it is in best evaluation in 64. I look at that every, all the time, all the cases are converging 0, 05, 0, 05, 2.50. Okay, like in all the cases. But what is interesting, you have all these functional evaluations, but also we can take a look at our whole trace here. So I have the table out. Remember that in table out, you save everything, all the iterations, and see what it's doing, not the maths, what was doing. So start from this point, it will add this perturbation, get the values, and then kind of it will move. If you know what is the simplex method, how it works now, I'm coming back now to this. 
figure here. It's something like that, no? It starts and then it starts to move and explore different different directions. So see that it starts to do that. And look at that already here. I know my behavior that already in these iterations here is already in that value. Already in like in 45, 46, or probably 50. It's already there, but now it's just moving. You it, that is small precision move a little bit here and that's why it took much much longer because now everything is just due to that precision so know your theory know what we you can know to fine tune here so you will have the tolerance of this method so maybe it will be better to try this case rerun and then there, there will be an option here that you can change the tolerance okay to avoid that so always you will have many options so be careful no okay variable tolerance so you can change this one so see that the default it was 10 to the minus 6 probably was too too much probably better to use a little bit less so the developers recommend this however everything is problem dependent so this can be an exercise for you to redo this case and see if you convert faster or if you converts to the same values if you change that tolerance. But in any case here, you clearly can see that already about 45. It was already that value and then it was just dancing around. No, it was flirting with that value. So this is another case. So this is the other method I like to use. So if I not if I don't use the the the, the efficient global, I go for this one. It's very efficient. It works very well. Okay, you can have noisy data, horrible data, and it will work very, very well. I really like this method. Now let's move to another method. So here I put many of them, but I'm not going to show. By the way, these two methods, they are very promising. Uh, I don't have the installation here because here you need to install an extra library, which is open source, but it, these ones are very promising. I recommend you to play with these methods, uh, in particular Snowpack. Uh, colony, uh, well, it works. It is what it is. So probably these are better. Uh, then you have this genie also, you have poor scaling. So here in the end, you, you need to focus in the methods that they have good scaling. No? So you can do a lot of con concurrent tasks. So usually this, all the calling and this, they don't perform very well. No, they have problems with the scaling, but let's move to this, the saga and as pattern search, the pattern search is kind of a, a simplex method, by the way, the simplex, this is a simplex method and there should be another simplex. This is another simplex and this is another simplex, so uh, kind of similar. And let's see documentation to show you what is it precisely doing that one. So is this one. Okay, I didn't have it there. Okay, so here it should be. Let's see. So that one is this pattern search. So pattern search, look at what it's doing is that, and even the maths that we use, just use is something similar. You start from, from a point and see that it start to look in all directions. And then when it detects a direction where that function is improving, it will start to move that. Okay, so all these parameters, this tension, expansion, contraction, and so on, it can be controlled. But here you get the idea that pretty much this is brute force. And all these derivative free methods will do, it will work in similar ways. Okay, so I mentioned that I want to run with the SOGA. SOGA means single objective genetic algorithm. It's a genetic algorithm, it's brute force as well. So basically we're going to generate a sampling It's going to explore and then it's going to follow some rules. Okay. Uh, to get to that optimal value, uh, those methods, they have a lot of options. So let me go here. Soga. It takes many parameters. So as you see, the, all of them are optional. So if you don't put anything, it will use the default values. So yeah, I recommend you to read a little bit the theory because you can improve a lot your convergence rate by fine tuning the, the, the parameters, but that is very problem de dependent. And there is a very nice library. Later, we're going to visit that one when we do some, when we use XGBoost or Tuna. So Tuna is optimize your optimization. So we're 
do an optimization on some engineering problem, but you can optimize your optimizer because you have many parameters in your optimizer. So basically this library, what it does is look at, the, uh, it will look at the hyper parameters that you have in your method and it will try to, to optimize the, those parameters to get the best performance. So this one has been careful not tune for to use with XGBoost. LightGBN is similar to XGBoost. It's open source as well. Now it's from Microsoft, then TensorFlow and so on. But you can use it as well for this method. I have used it. Uh, it's a little bit tricky. I don't want to go into details, but yeah, you have that, that option. And this is not the only library. No, there are many libraries that optimize the hyperparameters. So with that being said, let's go and launch uh, Soga. Okay, so Soga would use the default parameters. So default parameters will be about uh, bam, 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 thousand iterations. So maximum iterations, but the maximum population also function evaluations, it is a thousand. You have a hundred thousand, you will have an initial population Okay, someone, okay, here's your initial population is 50. And then from this initial population, it will start to, to evolve to give you a better idea. It will be something like this. As you look at this figure, this is what is happening. You start initial population and then it is evolving, evolving to that optimal value. So that is what is happening. Uh, it's going to save a lot of information. We're going to see what is that information. And this will be time consuming. Also, this have this method, it has a high level of parallelization. So if you have a thousand processors, in theory, you can run a thousand functions, evaluations in one iteration and have that solution ready. Okay, so here we're going to run using 12 cores, I think I, I put it, and then up to reaching the maximum value that will be like a thousand, eleven hundred, something like that. So let's see. Let me go Soga. Okay. Let's put this here. And just to be sure, yes, I have 12 concurrency. And let's run this one. So this is brute force, remember? And we have to wait here a little some time. Let me go here, Dakota clean out. And to get, let's get the solution and just to show you a little bit the outputs, the files and everything that we have. So I launched there and see that it's launching the maximum level of concurrency, all the processes running. And let me put here and you can see the parallelization. So let's wait at this point. Something also interesting that just to point out that I mentioned that we're using Salome and Salome used to have this problem that sometimes it was crashing because it's the TCP UDP ports, they were busy. You can see here right now I'm running live. This is important. I want to run live and to show you it's not crashing. So it seems that inversion is on 911, I think I'm using. They managed to fix that problem. Already I mentioned that I have run up to 10,000 evaluations and it didn't, it, it, it didn't crash. So it seems that that problem was solved and now it's becoming more attractive to Also they are fixing some, or no, they are making more friendly. How do you generate the cap? So it's an instead interesting tool, uh, spend some time trying to learn it as you find it useful, just put it, put it in your design optimization loop. Uh, yeah, I guess we need to create some videos about Salome. So everything is about time. It is the most precious commodity, but if some people want to help us with that. Yeah, you are open to contribute. So, okay, at this point, let me stay quiet and let's see what, what we have.
Okay, so I'm back and oh boy, that was expensive. So as you see, this is the cost you pay for using this genetic algorithm methods. Just to stress that I didn't uh, change the uh, hyperparameters or the parameters of the of the method. I know that by changing something here and there, I might reduce the number of iterations to probably, well, no, probably no, uh, 650 and I get the, the, the good result, but yeah, this is kind of, you know, going to a casino and just throwing the dice there to see what you can change. So here, no, the important parameters will be here. Now this is a genetic algorithm. So somehow we'll follow kind of a evolution, Darwinian uh, evolution rules, like crossover mutation, you will have different off prints and so on. So you control that, how everything evolve, starting from an initial population and different methods and, and, and so on. So it can be a little bit tricky to, uh, to optimize that, but yeah, it's time consuming. I'm not going into details. So I leave it to the theory. Okay. Uh, to you to, to, to search the theory is fascinating. The theory, but in a few, in few words, it, it is brute force. So we have all these iterations here. You have a big tray, so you can get an idea that, uh, is you're running large cases, you can run out of a space quite easy. So be careful about that plan your optimization case in a, a head and know your limitations and requirements. But what is interesting here is that we have all these files and in table out, you're going to have all the iterations, everything you have the report here, everything that it was doing. So as you see, it was just moving, 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 moving in the design space and so on. And then you have final data. This is important one. In Sogen final data, you will have the optimal value. And as you can see, is converging towards the value that we know. So it will be minus 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, and 0. Potato, potato, no, we are in there. So some numerical precision there, but we know that we're there. So the method is not going to pinpoint precisely, or probably yes, it can pinpoint precisely that value, but you need to let it run more or you need to change some options. But you see that we're converging to the solution. Important, this is Soga, single objective genetic algorithm, one single solution. If we use the MOGA, multi-objective genetic algorithm, which will be the next video, probably, you are going to have many solutions there. So you have here also the discard data. So this is all how is discarded populations and so on. So you have a lot of information here, but in this specific no soga, the only important one is this one. Okay, your final solution in the MOGA method that we're going to see later, uh, you have all the populations, so you can see how populations evolve. So pretty much will be uh, 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 will be this. So this that you see here that I'm plotting that the animation, those are the populations. So see that how populations are evolving from the initial one. Okay, then they start to discard some data, so on until it goes uh, right here that you have all the optimal solutions concentrated in that region. So all that trace you're going to ha have it in the MOGA here. Okay, many population files. So yes, you have the restart also. You can stop your simulation. You can restart it. Uh, this method it ha it has a high level of parallelization. So if you have a thousand processors, for instance, a thousand processors, uh, you can run a hundred simulation for ten with ten cores, and then in just 13 iterations, you will reach this. So you see that if you have those resources, you are very lucky and you can very fast get, get to those values. Also, just to mention that we have been talking about exploratory data analysis and meta models, machine learning, and that is tough. All this data that you have here, this is a lot of data, okay, that you have. However, do not use this data to construct models because this data, it is already biased towards an optimal solution. So you start to see here that kind of everything is concentrating at about one point. And you let me bring back here something I think I already showed. Okay. 
Okay, it's not this one. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, this here. So look at that. This data here that you see that we're plotting, this is biased data. And look at how everything is biased towards some values, know that the method to find it. So this is not going to be a good model. Your, your model needs to be a model, a random model that covers no, your, your design space. So be careful about about that. Probably I think here maybe we'll have some, some a larger data set. Okay, this one, this one. So we have two data set. This is a very large. So in this case, we were using 12 design variables. We have three outputs. We have one of these is a nonlinear constraint, if I will recall. And see that in this case, we have 750 experiments. I'm not going to say what, whatever we were optimizing there, but this is something CFD Dakota. And look at that here, all your design space is well, all the experiments are well distributed. So you are covering everything. Instead, when you use data coming from a genetic algorithm, so from a method where you are optimizing, this data will be biased. And see that here you can see clearly the bias of this data. When you look at here at, the, at these histograms, you see that you are not uniformly covering that that space so this is a problem do not use this for meta models machine learning because you are going to construct a very very bad model so here we come to the fact that machine learning ai that stuff is not black magic that depends on the data so whatever you have it will be as good as the input data so if you get this that would be really bad um but then we have all this stuff. So I think at this point, and okay, and just to get as well a confirmation. So here, um, bam, 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 final data. You have this as your final data. And in the log out, in the file, I think here mm -mm, we should have in what case. Okay, so yeah, this information I think is somewhere, somewhere. Sure. I don't recall where you have, where, where I have it, but somebody would tell you, okay, this in this function evaluation is the best case. So here you have no number of blah, 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 1300, and somewhere here you will have that information. I don't recall where specifically in that trace is but what you can do is that let me go table out so we do it in the dumbest possible way okay so see that it's a single value is this one function evaluation 1091 so let me go here to be sure that it's that one but yeah somewhere in your output you should have the number okay yeah it's that one dun 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 1091 so i go here See the word there is 1091. Well, 1091, yes. And then if I launch Patafon, apply, there you go. Your profile. So at this point, I guess you are familiar. This is the shape that we should, you should, you should, we should get now. We designed the experiments in such a way to get this. So voila, there you go. We explore. Uh, derivative free optimization methods. I think these are for CFD. I have to be honest, these are better than gradient based. As you can remind gradient based, uh, you need to give a lot of information. You need to know something about that problem. Otherwise it can be a little bit tricky to get it converged. You no know, stuff like a starting point, then how to compute gradients, step size and so on. So it can be tricky. So instead in this case, it's pretty much doesn't give anything. Just go there, brute force and, and get some solution. And there are different levels of efficiency. We saw that for this specific case, this one was the most efficient one. This one also was very efficient. And this all got mm. that pretty much it's time consuming, but it will get the same solution. This one also, I'm not going to run it, but I already have the solution there. And just to show you, uh, bam, 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 put it here and we have all the solutions there. So it's this one and this one, let's say that actually that one. Oh yeah. 
was quite fast in 60 iterations. Actually, let me run it and see that this one pinpoint a very good value, you know, so here you have it. So, okay. So, okay, let, let's run that one. Okay. So we confirm that. Let me go here and I go Dakota clean out, erase all that data and let me put it here. Okay. I forgot about that. So it's a good solution. Excellent scaling. Ah, okay. I have the comment here, super fast for this case. So let's go and run this one. So this one as well, it will, it has a high level of parallelization so we can exploit that. So there you go. It's launching everything there. We can check here all the processes. So it's running the maximum number of function evaluations and yeah, we are running right at this point. Let's, let's wait for the, for the solution. Okay, so it is done here. So it was super fast. You can check, always check now your, your output there. You will have all the results. And let me go and I like to see this one. And there you go. In this case, you have the best function evaluation here, 34. And you have actually this one precisely pinpoint that optimal solution there and this specific meta that what it's doing already so here but is that search in space here this one so it's doing something like this as creating this cross there and then it's moving moving in the direction where it's improving so this is doing it's doing doing this in your I, let, for the lack of a better term, I will call it your hyperspace, where you have all your design variables. So in our case, our hyperspace is four design variables. So it will start to expand and contract in every direction of each design variable. And it will move and this is brute force, but it was very precise. It was fast in this case, it was very fast. Personally speaking, now I'm recalling that this case, when you start to add more variables, it, the performance will, will tend to be a little bit worse, but yeah, it works very well. And you have all your trace there, your files with all the information and so on. Uh, so at this point, let's wrap up here. And um, one very important takeaway, you saw there that we run all these, these cases, many simulations, a thousand, and it didn't crash. So remember, when you do this stuff, you need to be sure that your optimization load have to be uh, full tolerant and also free of any defects because if it crash, you're wasting time. But also be careful that you need to be able to restart in the case of the loop is stopping for whatever reason. So Dakota will give you all those capabilities. You have the Dakota restart uh, file there. You can restart it. You save all your trace. Also, when you create your optimization load, everything, be careful that all files you have there, you are not missing anything. Formulate your problem. And I know that I'm repeating this a lot, but yeah, you have to be very careful. So you formulate your problem, you have your simulator script, all your steps, nothing is missing. You have your template case and your case base that no, you know that it's always running. So probably I can put this template case also outside, but I leave it there because some cases I can change something. But yeah, be careful to have all files, nothing is missing. And I think the most complicated thing probably is getting the the output in the right format. So depending on what you are doing, it can be tricky. So in this case, I'm computing a mean value, but it might be something different. So getting this metric, it might be tricky. So there are many techniques that I will Leave it to you. I, I have used some crazy methods to, to, to do that, in particular when I have unsteady behavior. So how do you know 
when to stop the simulation, but also in what range of value you need to average. So I use some techniques there now. So, but yeah, you 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 made it. Uh, you it's up to you. So with that, I'm done for derivative free. Next video will be about multi-objective optimization. So hope you find it useful. See you next time. Bye.